Hello and welcome to today's webinar on Project Panama, what it's all about. Um, we're just going to give it a couple of minutes for other attendees just to join and be ready um, before we actually start with the content. So we'll just wait a couple of minutes. more people cool. okay so i think we've got most people um on now so if we start today's webinar project panama what it's all about thank you very much for joining us today uh, before we get started on the main content i've got a couple of housekeeping notes for you um, so we are recording the session and we will circulate the recording and the slides after the session um, it's worth pointing out that this is actually the first of three uh, in the series about Project Panama. Um, so we're going to include links to the subsequent webinars in that email communication. So do look out for that and sign up to the next lot of webinars. Um, if there's any question, if you've got any questions uh, during the session, um, if you want to write them in the questions box um, and we'll get to them at the end of the session. Um, if for any reason we get inundated and we don't manage to get to all the questions, we'll respond to you directly after the webinar. So today's webinar is being presented by Carl D. Carl is a senior developer advocate at Azul Systems, and he is somewhat of a Java guru. Um, before he starts his slides, he just wanted to find out a little bit more about you guys, um, just to make sure that he can um, make sure your level of understanding before he gets going. So we're just going to do a quick poll um, and ask you a question. So um, here's the poll. Do you currently use JNI or have you used it in the past? And if you can select yes, no, or not heard of it, what is it? Um, and then uh, I will share the results when everyone's completed uh, the poll. So I think we've nearly got everybody there. Yeah, I think we've got everybody there. So I close the poll and here are the results. So brilliant, 70% have I do currently use it or have used it in the past and just 30% of you haven't. Um, so thank you for filling that in. Uh, and without further ado, I will hand you over to Carl and we'll get started with the main content. Thank you, Harriet. So thank you for coming to the uh, webinar. This is a, kind of like a workshop uh, style. So I'm really excited about telling you about Project Panama because it's been long in coming and a little spoiler alert, uh, uh, the, some aspects or the um, APIs that are part of uh, Project Panama are foreign function and memory access APIs, those will be in preview release in JDK 19 coming in the September timeframe. So the intent of this is to really help people be proficient when it comes out. Um, really quick, uh, uh, before we get into the talk, I just wanna uh, give a shout out to fuj.io. It's where a lot of um, people in the Java community uh, contribute and blog and uh, write content. And if you feel like you want to share or contribute uh, and be an author, just um, you, that we have a Slack channel and you can sign up and uh, check it out. So here's the agenda. We have um, 
uh, Java in the state of native access. And we have what is Project Panama, um, a few demos, and how to get started using Project Panama, um, where you download the JDK and we can actually um, talk to native code. So what is the state of Java and native access? So for those that uh, you know are new to um, this, um, as a Java developer, did you ever need access to native code such as OpenGL or SDL uh, libraries to access and take advantage of uh, hardware such as GPU to have high performance graphics or ac access to a device such as an RFID card reader? Um, well, if you answered yes, then you probably have heard of JNI, which is Java Native Interface. And those that um, have used it in the past or have not used it in the past, they know that it's it's really, really tough to actually uh, work with. And so let me explain. So like it, when you create Java or use Java um, Native Interface or JNI, you first create an interface, which is Java code or a um, interface using the keyword native. And in that, um, there's no implementation. And then the actual implementation is written in C or C++, where it follows a naming convention. And this code is actually generated with another tool. Um, but this is native code and um, it's, very difficult to maintain when the underlying native library actually changes. So another thing to note is that it incurs it incurs some uh, performance penalties, and I'll explain why. So let's go back in time to see what J and I used to look like, and it still does. So I was on a project. Uh, this is a true story. Uh, back in the day. It was a pure Java project on the server and it was running on Windows. And it needed to create uh, events or uh, calendar, uh, scheduled calendar events and tasks. And so we looked around on the internet and we found uh, this library. It's called the Jacob Project from Dan Adler. He still maintains it, by the way. And look at the copyright date, it's it's pretty old. And uh, for the Windows operating system or Windows Office products, you could use uh, this library. Um, it's basically a Java COM bridge, which talks to uh, COM or ActiveX controls in the um, Microsoft world. Um, and so this library allows you to uh, create things within like Microsoft Excel or schedule or talk to these COM components. So here's a architecture or how you would go about uh, writing um, an application that talk, uses the library. So first, um, sorry, the, the first layer is your application layer, which is the business logic that then talks to the Jacob library which then, um, like I showed before, the native code, which is the implementation code, uh, the wrapper code, that then talks to the native library. So wouldn't it be great if you could just talk directly to the native library without bypassing the JNI layer? So now you can with Project Panama in JDK 19 um, early access. You can get that today. That's an office office space reference. So what is Project Panama? Project Panama is really an umbrella project. It's more than just calling native functions. Uh, you can, it won't, starting from the left is the vector API. Um, that's not to be confused with uh, java.util.vector, which is uh, related to collections. This uh, vector API is for matrix math or vector um, 
computations. Uh, it has access to um, SIMD hardware, uh, single instruction multiple data for uh, you know vector vector math and vector computations. And then starting within uh, still within that umbrella, you have the uh, foreign linker API and the foreign memory access API. The foreign memory access API is a fundamental uh, thing when they started this um, project. It was a very fundamental part in uh, really defining memory. And so um, afterwards, um, the, the main things that are going to be released in preview is uh, the foreign function and memory access APIs that talk to the things below. And so uh, JEP 424, um, so here's a timeline or roadmap of when this was first, um, a lot of the JEPs or the um, Java enhancement proposals were created back in 2018. Of course, a lot of these uh, JEPs, or not JEPs, but the ideas and the um, uh, the implementation or the, you know, it it was a culmination of many uh, many PhDs and and a whole bunch of really smart people at Oracle that created a lot of these APIs. So, um, starting from left to right, you have uh, you know, April 2018 to 2020, uh, 2021, which is the main uh, JEPs that I spoke of, which is the talk, what this talk is about. Um, out of uh, incubator one and two came um, now is earlier this year, is uh, 2022, which is uh, the JEP 424 which is the preview release that's in uh, JDK 19. So what is a preview release? A preview release is basically um, a stage where they move things out of the incubator modules where it, you, you used to have to add these modules using a switch. Now you don't have to use those switches anymore because it's in Java proper, which is java.lang, dot foreign um, namespace in the, the package namespace. So um, all you have to do is use it. But then you also have to enable the preview features. So this, uh, the switch in the upper right, uh, enable preview is a switch to unlock the preview um, things. So when it goes in the um, GA, you wouldn't need that switch and you wouldn't need, you know, also the add module. So you'll have this um, this uh, API um, automatically. So why Project Panama, you ask? Well, basically, it's all these really great, great benefits. Um, you have ease of use. It's pure Java. You don't have to write any JNI code. Um, here, it's as fast or faster than JNI because, like I showed showed the um, indirection, um, you can just, you don't have to, you can avoid those uh, calls. Uh, general purpose, uh, there's different types of memory architectures. Uh, you could uh, also deal with, uh, you know, different uh, like 32-bit uh, architectures or 64-bit or uh, big Indian or little Indian. And also um, uh, safety. Um, a lot of um, unsafe operations are disabled by default, and I will show you later uh, the switch that will enable them. So how does Project Panama actually talk to these native libraries? Well, currently, um, Panama supports a well-known convention called the CABI, or Application Binary Interface. It's uh, very mature. It's been around forever because C is, you know, pretty, uh, pretty legacy. Not legacy, but very mature. And so, uh, uh, an example would be Python. Python, if you go to, um, or uh, Python and TensorFlow, 
The um, TensorFlow is a machine learning uh, machine learning library that uh, is written in C, and it's a library that uh, also follows the C ABI, uh, which allows other languages like Python. Um, if you look at tensorflow.org, it's the main site where all the tutorials, uh, they seemingly, you know, all the examples are written in Python, but they're actually talking to C native libraries. So Python has the ability to talk to native libraries also because they follow the C ABI, and now Panama follows and supports the C ABI. Now there's a, there's other talk about possibly following the C++ ABI, and uh, but it's very complex and and um, it's it's hard to tell, you know, over time. But C ABI is is um, so because of that. Yes, uh, other language can also um, talk to the C ABI and access these very mature and popular libraries. Also, following the C ABI, you can actually create callbacks, which is pretty impressive, where you can create a uh, Java static method and you can actually pass that like a lambda or a closure it, it feel or a closure like syntax or it's actually a static function or static method that you pass into uh, the C function. And then it can actually invoke your Java function from, from the native code. So here's an example of a demo that I created that takes, um, it's pure Java, it uses uh, Project Panama, and to render the window, uh, it uses the SDL library or the simple direct media layer and the um, 3D cube that's rendered or rotating on the um, OpenGL surface. And um, so I'm using both of those libraries to um, generate that demo. So here's a um, quick glimpse of what the code looks like. Um, uh, so here on the left, it's, it's purely uh, vertices that make up, well, not vertices, but just an array of floats that make up um, the color uh, ranges uh, of gradient. Um, so you have RGB and uh, um, that's how it makes the gradient in this code. And so uh, I won't talk about this uh, later, but um, in a later webinar, we'll, we'll talk about the memory access APIs. But to the right, you'll see how it can take um, um, arrays and it can actually create them in the C world or the native world. And then uh, it actually builds them off of the Java's memory heap, which is pretty cool. And then I have a function here, and you'll notice these GL color 3 FV, uh, these um, already generated functions. I use a tool called uh, J Extract that used to come with the JDK uh, of the uh, the Panama builds um, from the development branch. Um, I'll explain that um, at the end of the talk where um, they separated the, uh, the project uh, J extract. So it's not included when you download JDK 19 today, uh, you're not gonna get the J extract tool, but it generates a lot of these functions and they look just like um, in this, you know, the C world or the C implementation. So those who are familiar with OpenGL will feel pretty right at home and, and see that it's almost identical. Um, if you notice uh, some of the key, um, the constants like GL no error or GL projection, those are methods um, in Java. However, in the C world, they're actually constants uh, or defines. So they, it looks almost identical. So it, it makes it, things a lot easier if you go to convert code, old code that was written in OpenGL. 
So, and this is the render loop or the render code where it takes the vertices and it, and it builds the faces on the cube and then um, it rotates it. So here's another great library. Here's an example of using FFmpeg and FFmpeg is a uh, audio video streaming library where it can encode and decode um, uh, video uh, frames. And so you can actually stream things into a Java application. And here I wrote a Java FX application uh, placed in the uh, scene graph. And then I take a canvas, uh, a transparent layer over top of the video as it's being displayed. And as I move my mouse, I can actually click and I create a library that allows you to create callouts that um, you know point out things of interest and a little fancy uh, little so that that kind of is neat where you can mix and take full advantage of these mature libraries. So, how do we use the power that we just learned um, from from those demos? Well. We're going to get started by simply downloading the, the latest JDK 19. It's the early access release, of course. So you have to use that switch that I, I will mention. Um, or you can go to the actual development uh, um, of the JDK 19. Uh, you, you can download it there too. So the first thing you do after you download it, untart or unzip it to a directory, and then you set your environment variables, Java home and your Java path, uh, you know, so that you can actually use that um, JDK. Uh, just keep in mind, uh, watch out for, if you download it from the, uh, the jdk.java.net uh, site, uh, the home path might be jdk-19 uh, slash content slash home. So that, that might be different. But if you get it from Azul, uh, it's the same across all platforms. So a quick check, just run java-version, and you should see you know, uh, the version 19. So before we actually write uh, Panama code or binding code to talk to native functions, we're going to just look at what a hello world looks like in uh, native C. So first, there's an include um, that are called header files, uh, .h extension, uh, the standard I.O., which is standard input output, similar to Java's um, uh, system.out.print line or printf, uh, those functions allow you to, um, you know, allow keyboard input or, or output to the console. They have a main similar to Java's, but theirs has a return type of a C int. Um, and typically, uh, it means, Typically, it means, uh, I'll show you that later, I'm sorry. Um, so here's the printf, that is a function that is within the standard io.h. Uh, the first argument, or the return argument, is um, the int, which is uh, the number of characters that it outputs. Uh, the first argument is a const char, you know, asterisk, uh, format, which is actually a pointer to a character array in, in C. That's how they represent a string. Uh, it's not like Java. Um, it's, it's actually a C array and it's, it's what is called null terminated. It's a null, it's a character, it's called a null character that terminates the actual string length so when it goes to print it. And I'll talk more about the var args on the end. 
But here um, for the main function or the entry point within a main is the, um, the return type. Uh, usually in the Unix world, uh, they return a zero and um, that means everything is okay. And if they uh, return anything else, it's either an error or status code. It, it helps in using um, shell scripting. And if you pass a zero, you can pipe it into things and, and continue. So it's kind, of, it's kind of nice. So, okay, so now we're gonna actually um, write this thing in uh, project pound or use uh, foreign function and memory access APIs using Panama. Um, if you kind of get lost or you want to see the code right away, you can head over to github.com slash Carl D, that's my account, slash Panama webinar. And that's where you'll see the uh, hello world example and how we did it in this uh, talk. So to actually uh, call a function, native, call a native function, there's three steps. Um, you have to create a memory session, which we'll talk about later. It's a, a try resource block. Um, and then you create what is called a method handle. And there's a concept of a linker similar to C where there's a method called down call handle, which makes calls into native code, but you have to create, uh, uh, you have to describe or define the um, uh, function signature. And then you just invoke it. And I'll explain more in detail later. So, so how do you create a memory session? And so a memory session, what it is, it's, it's a type of scope where in the C native world, what you wanna do is you might be creating um, memory and uh, such as variables or um, allocating memory. And so they have this concept of open confined scope um, we're going to use this for now, uh, but when you leave the scope right here from the curly braces, um, it will deallocate memory um, and collect the garbage, which is really cool because usually uh, it, it's like it's the feel of Java. You know, there's no uh, you don't need to clean up. Uh, uh, you don't have to deal with garbage collection. But um, so in the native world. Um, all the objects will be collected um, when it reaches, when it leaves the scope. Because when you create a memory session, it implements the closable, which um, that's where the implementation actually cleans up the rest of uh, whatever's created from that memory session. So there's other uh, methods that we won't go into, but there's open shared, uh, depending on um, um, threading context or you're sharing um, the scope and you don't want to clean up if you're talking to another method. So, so now we're going to create a method handle. But before we create a method handle, let's, uh, I just want to uh, throw some definitions down uh, as to what is a method handle. And this is my definition. Um, it's a simple definition. Uh, a me method handle is basically a Java object that references native C functions or C variables in memory. So they're, they're basically things that are in memory um, and you can access them, invoke them, um, similar to um, in the C world, the, the linker actually contains uh, these native, um, these symbols. And so here's the official definition where you can look it up yourself. Um, it's according to the Java doc since uh, JDK seven, uh, it's more technical uh, jargon, but it, it, it's in the same, um, 
uh, idea of actually, you know, uh, dealing with lower level operations like talking to native. So again, before we actually write uh, a method handle, we, we have to actually understand the, the methods or the function signature. I always get that confused. Um, when I say function, it's more C world. And then when I say method, it means the Java world. But, uh, and sometimes they're synonymous when I, when I get uh, a little tripped up. But anyhow, um, what you want to do is define the call site of the C function. You have to understand what it's returning. Uh, it's, a, it's returning a C um, int, which is uh, almost similar to a Java int. Um, however, the lower level um, part of the platform, the hardware could be at a different, uh, it could be, it has Indianness or it could be a big Indian or little Indian. So uh, different hardware architectures, um, they have uh, the most significant bytes or the least significant byte. Uh, they have different ordering. Uh, so that's why Java is pretty cool where it, it's, it's cross-platform because it already knows the Indianness on the platform. So here you're defining it and uh, based on the platform and it's 32 bits using the with bit alignment. So these static um, predefined uh, value layouts are already within Project Panama or in the APIs. So that's how you describe um, a Java int or a C int. So it's, so let me backtrack for a minute. The, um, the, this concept of a value layout is a way to describe the native value represented in memory. So uh, what you want to do is this is the interaction between in the Java world and the C or the native world. And so here um, you, you, you're, um, we're using this value layout to represent what is being returned, which is a C int, and we'll use that Java underscore int that represents the the value type and layout. And so here is simple. It's the symbol name. It's just printf. Um, we'll, we use a string to look it up. First argument, again, um, I talked about value layouts. There's another one where it's of int and of um, floats of doubles, there's an of address also. And so that represents a pointer, which the underlying uh, system is probably 64 bits. Um, you know, um, it's an address pointer to a, um, a thing in memory, which is a character array that represents that string, that C string that's going to be passed in as the first argument. And of course, in printf, just like in Java's printf, you have um, these substitution um, abilities where if you use percent %s, it, you can substitute a string. And then if you have a percent %d, it, it, you could pass in, a, I believe it's a decimal. So you can have variable arguments passed in and it would substitute it into that first argument string. So now that we know how this function signature looks like, we'll use, um, now we can create a method handle. And the, the key to this next part is the function descriptor class which describes using those value layouts that we just talked about. So again, I, I spoke of a linker. It's the concept of uh, in the C world where uh, symbols are actually uh, stored in memory and you have to look them up. So you obtain the linker, then I create a string that represents the symbol name, which is printf. And then there's the first place I look, 
which is the default lookup within the linker to look up that thing in memory. And when you look it up, it comes back as a memory segment. Um, that's very important. We'll be talking about that in the second webinar, but that is uh, very important. It's used throughout. It's very fundamental to all the APIs. Uh, it's all about memory. Memory APIs or uh, memory access APIs are very important. Um, the lookup method here, uh, it, it's, it uses the Fluent API. It returns an um, optional, so then you can chain it with an OR. Um, and I have a Lambda that actually looks it up in the second location, which is the system, uh, the symbol lookup. And the symbol lookup is an area where um, you can actually create, uh, you can dynamically load libraries, such as like in the uh, Windows world, they're, they're DLL files. In the Win, uh, Linux world, it's .so files. In the Mac world, it's .die lib files. And, and so you can actually dynamically load these at will, or you can use the um, java.library path, and that would load uh, whatever library you have into memory, uh, into the linker, and then you can look them up. So I created this little convenient uh, little chaining thing just to look it up. So you could always extract that, create it into a utility function so you can look up anything. And and if you can't find it, you'll that or else throws, it throws a um, runtime exception be, because you can't find, it can't find it in either place. So the default lookup is where all the standard input output and all the standard ANSI C libraries probably exist and other things such as uh, like probably get PID for um, in the Linux world. So now that we looked up our symbol in memory, it comes in as a memory segment. We pass that memory segment as the first argument in the down call handle, like I mentioned before, from the linker, um, object instance, you can um, actually make the call. But the most important thing is the second argument, which is a function uh, function descriptor. That's the description of the, the C function signature that we talked about earlier. So the first argument of the of method is Java underscore int, which is a value layout that describes the return type. And the second argument is the first argument, which is that C pointer to a um, to a character array, which represents a string for the first uh, value. And I'll talk more about the var args or the variable arguments on the end. So there's another method called avoid, which allows you to um, just um, create a function descriptor that represents a C function that returns nothing. Or, or just like in Java, uh, when you when a function or a method returns nothing, it's a void. So uh, the first argument, if you were to write it, that it didn't return anything, it would be a void and then the address or you know whatever arguments that are passed in so again, I just wanted to reiterate uh, what a value layout is. There's subclasses that are predefined, um, um, kind of abstract. It's called of address, and then it further creates uh, predefined ones that you can actually use called like Java int, uh, Java float, Java double, Java, um, uh, the various primitives that map in the C world as you interact between the two worlds. So you can actually create your own if, if something of a different architecture. So you can talk to native devices or, you know, uh, you're taking a stream off a network and maybe whatever's transmitted is a, a different uh, um, byte order. So now that 
we've created a method handle, now it's time to invoke it. So there's two ways to actually invoke it. Um, but before we invoke it, we wanna pass in a string for the printf, just like in Java, uh, the print line. Here, you actually have to create a C string. So uh, there's a convenient um, convenience uh, method within the um, memory session where it'll allocate it. And of course, when you come out of scope, it'll clean up that string that was allocated. Uh, so there's this function called allocate UTF-8 string. You just pass in the string and it'll actually create something in memory off of the Java's memory heap that is a native um, thing in memory that holds your string. And all you have to do, uh, we've already described it in the method handle, and we just invoke it. There's a function called invoke. So you have to be careful with this invoke because of, uh, you know, there's um, might be casting involved because it doesn't it doesn't know what type it is until runtime. So there's another method called invoke exact where you have to it's more strict and you have to cast it to what it should be. So you cannot just call invoke exact on a on a printf if it actually returns something, it'll it'll throw an error. So you have to cast it the return type here. So we talked about how simple it is, sort of simple, to actually just create a printf. However, there's the end part where it passes in variable arguments. And for instance, uh, um, I, I believe you've seen this maybe in Java also. Some people use printf in, in the Java world. Uh, but here again, with the substitution, um, um, you could use percent %s to substitute a string and percent %d for, I believe it's a decimal or a number. Um, and so this is a reference from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And this is what we want to try and do. So how would you actually represent a var args? So here you would actually um, again, it's based on the function descriptor. It's it's how we define it. And there's a convenience method, um, as you'll see here. The of, um, the first argument is the return type. We're not using of void. So we know the return type. And then there's a um, method called append argument layouts, which that's what it means that you can actually start appending the different arguments uh, value layouts that you want. Now, there's a convenience, another convenience method called um, as veridic, which is meant to actually um, represent it in um, like it was in C, um, but it's still very specific because you're telling it to the first argument is that output string uh, that will represent. You still have to convert it to a C string, but that uh, string that you see at the top um, output, uh, that has to be converted to a C string. That's the first argument. It's an address. Second argument is another address. It's another C string representing what's going to be substituted. Uh, it's, I believe it's the string universe. And then the third and last uh, parameter is a integer. So here, um, I basically created uh, temporary variables, uh, arguments one through three, that represents uh, the first argument, which is a, a C string. The second argument is also a C string. And the third argument is um, a integer. A, um, so once you pass it in uh, using invoke, and it just outputs it. So another thing to note, really important, while this is not the most performant because you have to uh, code in exactly um, the number of arguments and the various types, uh, 
uh, it's you would have to create this as a uh, a final static um, instance in your code to make the JVM you know uh, optimize it because it knows it's um, you know known up front so the JVM can actually uh, JIT compile it or put intrinsics or whatever it does to optimize that uh, method handle when you make the call. But it's still faster than, you know, J and I. <laughs> so is there a better way because you, you had to specify all these uh, file um, function descriptors? Well, yes. Uh, like I mentioned before, there's a thing called J-Extract. It's a tool that used to included but they decided to pull it out and make it a separate project because um, there's other advancements coming down the pike um, like uh, uh, Valhalla, Project Valhalla which um, is another project that can make uh, um, things even smaller in memory and such so J-Extract would have to create the binding code based on um, the newer APIs, but for now it's it's pretty nice. It still works uh, against you know known C ABI libraries that are exposed that you can actually it'll create binding code. So like if you use J extract against standard io.h, it's just a simple. You could use any number of arguments as if it was um, if you're like writing writing it in C or uh, even Java, Java system dot out dot printf. You could just um, make sure you have the uh, right string in the front, and then you pass it in, and it's just that convenient without having to redefine everything. So now we're coming to the end. Uh, now you want to run it in Java 11, I believe. Um, they have a way to actually run a Java program as source. If it's a single file, you don't need to compile it. It's kind of interesting. But in order to, uh, the first switch here is to enable native access. Um, like um, we mentioned before about the benefits where uh, uh, native access is uh, disabled by default. And so again, um, you have to uh, enable the preview features that are in JDK 19 because it is a preview release of Project Panama, um, the foreign function and memory APIs. And so um, that dash dash source 19 is only if you wanna run a single source file um, like hello world.java. Um, you're not compiling if as long as it's one file. Uh, and so if um, if you compile it, you don't need the dash source, it won't, uh, I, you need to remove it. So if you're compiling it actually, like if you're using Java C, you'd, you need that dash dash source 19. Um, but when you're running it as a class file, not a hello world.java, you need uh, you don't need the source 19 if you're just running it as a class file. So there's the output and uh, that's how you run it. So in closing, here's a summary. We, we went through um, some use cases and, and JNI pain points. We went through what Java Pro Project Panama actually is. It's it's more than just the foreign function and memory APIs or JEP 424. It it also consists of vector APIs. Um, and so we talked about you know how Project Panama actually accesses native libraries using the CABI and a couple of demos. And then uh, we ended with uh, actually defining a method handle, creating a method handle and actually invoking uh, the, the native functions. So here's some uh, references. Uh, um, if, like again, I just wanna mention um, 
uh, the GitHub project uh, of this actual webinar. So you can look at the code, um, mess around with it, and, and have fun. Um, yeah, before I hand it over to Harriet for questions and, and such, I I want to um, I want to um, talk about Azul and the company I work for. Um, at Azul, we build high-performance Java runtimes to help customers reduce infrastructure costs. Um, we have two JVMs to choose from. One is called um, Azul Platform Core or Zulu. Uh, it's the unoptimized version. It's a free version. Uh, if it, you, it's optional for paid support. And we have the uh, high performance version, which has high performance features, um, such as uh, it's called Platform Prime, and it has uh, features such as a uh, pauseless garbage collection. Uh, it's called the C4 uh, garbage collector. We have uh, the Falcon JIT compiler. It highly optimizes code. Uh, it's, it replaces the JIT compiler. And um, we have other features that are uh, pretty cool for various companies and various use cases. If you want uh, really fast um, running Java, and also it's really cool because um, it's you know like Java, uh, the WARA means write once, run anywhere. So you could just you don't have to change a line of code. You just run your jar file on top of that uh, JVM and and you can experience very cool fastness. Um, so head on over to azul.com and and um, check us out. So any questions? Uh, just um, yeah. Can... So I've been keeping an eye on the question box, and uh, I can't see any at the moment. So if anybody has got any questions, then please do pop them in the box now. Um, either the chat or the question box. Um, maybe to get you started, um, I thought of one. Um, so related to sort of a lot of what you talked about, do you see Panama replacing all JNI? Oh, no. Um, this is a good question because um, I've gone to a conference and on some a lot of people, they don't know how it's, you know, it, because the official... Um, site when it talks about project panama it says um replace but it's not really meaning replace uh it's not a replacement it it um you can um you can use it with they can coexist together you can incrementally um move towards panama if you choose to um sometimes it depends on the project size and risk that you want to take because sometimes uh projects uh are more than there's lots of code that um could be very dangerous to uh swap swap out so it's important to write tests to validate uh the performance characteristics that you're looking for okay great thanks for that that clarification so I'm not sure I understand this one 100%, but I'll, I'll try. So how to search a method inside a DLL slash SO? Does that mean more to you, Carl? <laughs> um, how do you say, I'm sorry, repeat that. You're, how do you how, look at How do you search a method inside a DLL slash SO? Oh, how do you search? Well, uh, I can't remember, but within, um, your your compiler usually in the native world there um, you could use GCC or um, um, C Lang it's a it's your C compiler there's an actual switch that will look at um, you have to have the headers available to look at the functions that are available within the DLL or SO so in its binary format, you, you're not going to know. But if you use, if you have the header files available, then you know. And you could use JExtract, and that, it can actually generate the binding code for you. But even looking at the 
header files, you can actually create them yourself like we saw in the hello world example, just defining the function descriptor, you know the value layouts and you can actually build it yourself. But uh, yes, if you don't have the header files, you're out of luck. Uh, but the thing is, there's a switch on the uh, various compilers that you could um, you could run that switch and it'll actually tell you the location of the header files. Okay. Um, there is another question, but I really don't know. Um, <laughs> so where did the linker search for the print function? Uh um, it, so when you um, when you use okay in JNI and in Panama, just it's been around forever. It's the in uh, Java there's Java properties, and one of the properties is called Java um, dot library path, and and that's to load other libraries, but it printf comes from the platform. And so uh, because by default, Panama understands ANSI C or the C libraries, it's already built in. So um, the default lookup um, in the linker, there's a default lookup. That's where it those things are already loaded in memory. So when you use the linker, the native linker method that returns you a linker, um, the standard functions are already there. So that's that's where you look it up. Um, I, I made it a little fancy for a function so that anyone can pass in a string to look up a symbol and you know it would error if it couldn't find it. But the when you uh, have Project Panama or JDK 19, uh, all those standard uh, functions like printf are already in Panama. So you can actually, uh, it's in the default lookup. You, you can just grab them, if that makes sense. <laughs> Great, thanks, Carl. Um, at the moment, that's all the questions we've got. Um, so we're, we're heading towards the hour anyway. So I think unless there's any other questions, um, I can thank everybody for joining. I hope you found it really insightful. Um, look out for the uh, communication where we'll send the slides and the video of this webinar, as well as where you sign up for the next um, webinars in the series on Project Panama. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. See ya. Bye. Bye-bye.